what we're trying to do is to get from you know point A to point B, and and um, we know that people are going to follow this when it's delicious and dazzling, and um, so these are the people who are doing this. So on on the bill is Sherry Yard. Sherry is. Um, uh, when I met when I met her, I showed up to meet her at Spago late at night, and she said, "Oh, you've got to have this." And so out came I don't know how many desserts, and they were all killer. I mean killer, and um, she really knows how to make stuff that people like, and it's it's just kind of fundamental talent. And so she got interested and involved in whole grain, and so we're really glad to have her. Um, Chad, I think his latest book, the Tartine book number three, I think is really, it's an important work, you know, in, in so far as understanding uh, what to do with whole grains. And so we're really glad to have you. <coughs> um, I won't go through, Edward Mor Eduardo Morel is making um, breads out at the Presidio, out at the... Not anymore. I, I, three months ago, I just moved my bakery to Berkeley. So now you're in Berkeley. So he's been making whole grain for four years? Four, uh, 14 years. 14 years. Uh, Dave Miller is kind of um, someone who everybody points to as sort of like bedrock, who's been doing this, um, milling his own flour and making really delicious bread for a long time. Up to hell and gone, I think, is where it is, right? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Um, Jonathan is the bread lab, and I think you're going to want to talk about what the bread, the bread lab is and what you're trying to do. And um, there was just a Mother Jones article about what Jonathan <coughs> is doing with Stephen in the bread lab, and the bread lab is a really important resource for us. Janice has another lab, which is another important re resource for us, and so we're, we're trying to learn how to use the labs so that um, it's not an industrial structure, but uh, something that we can learn from. Um, Josie is sort of a phenomenon right now. <laughs> He's getting uh, pretty well known and has a, uh, a store in San Francisco called The Mill and he's milling his own flour and, and making very good bread. And then Rhonda um, is um, up north making uh, Beck's, uh, Beck's Bakery in, in um, Arcata. And so I just wanted to get some sense from you. Let's, let's start with kind of the build, which let's start with Sherry and Chad and, um, and, and Jonathan and understand uh, what you got, you know, like how you got into it and, and what you've discovered and, and where you think you can go. There's the. Okay, wow. Um, goodness, uh, let's see. My name is Sherry and I used white flour for the last, I've been baking 30 years. <laughs> While I'm not faceless, tasteless, or soulless, um, at one point or another, I had some clientele that were coming into our restaurants, and uh, uh, Ethiopian and, and different folks back in the day, and I started to make injera and started to make other flatbreads. And so that was my introduction. It was very organic. It wasn't, oh, I want to heal, heal, or heal the people or make a really great, great loaf of bread. So little bit of little, and the beauty of being in a restaurant is that most folks don't know what's in things because you don't have labels. They just know it tastes good. So um, that's how I kind of got into it. Uh, and I've continued on. When, we, uh, when I came on, we had recipes like the matzah, the flatbread at Spago. And I thought, there's no way I'm going to ever be able to change that. They'll hang me on Sunset Boulevard. Uh, and then I had the opportunity two years ago when we revamped Spago. And as we opened up every new location from our cuts, steakhouses, uh, to the Bel Air Hotel. And I never said a word. We just started to put things in. And people would say, wow, that tastes really amazing. Uh, and then we went on to reopen Spago, and then there wasn't anything that wasn't whole grain on the menu, uh, including the, a Teff flatbread, which I brought to our last meeting, and people seemed to like it. Uh, and the great part is no one missed the old flatbread. For 20 years, they had been eating this white bread with a little bit of ho uh, honey in it that they covered and smathered with all sorts of ingredients that you couldn't even taste anything underneath. So when I swapped it out, and everyone liked it better, hallelujah. So I think the whole marketing testament to that is that, uh, 
you know, I, I take the granny approach, you know, just eat it, you'll like it, don't worry about it. And so that's where I am with it. I am moving on now. I've, I uh, left Wolfgang about a year ago. I'm opening a bakery called the Helms Bakery in Los Angeles. Haven't, haven't stuck a, a thing into the ground yet. It's going to be about nine months away. And moving forward with that, I said, how am I now going to share that same sensibility? I go to the farmer's market. I buy all the fruit. And there's the confession and the guilt. You know, we were ta I've been talking to some old bakers. I sat in a room back in Vegas uh, over 20 years ago at the IBIE, and we listened to Dr. Sugihara. It was a room like this. It was just really amazing. The folks that were in the room, mind-blowing. Uh, Professor Cavell was there. And we were talking about ash content being low. We were talking about protein content being high, how to get high moisture, how to get good hard mixes on things. We thought that was the promised land. So we go off for the next 10 years, and you can make a girl really depressed, right? Because you spent 10 years putting all that stuff together, and then you're like, wah, 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 wah. Um, <laughs> so then you go off on that other path, and here I am. So moving forward to the Helms, uh, the idea is when I first came on to the plans, uh, the Helms, for anyone who doesn't know, the, the uh, Helms building was built in 1928. It was the largest production baking facility west of the Mississippi. It closed in 1969 because women started to work. We had highways, supermarkets started, and unions took over, so it went belly up. Right after, uh, it went to the moon. It was the only bread on the moon. How cool is that? It also was in the Olympics. It was all this cool, cool bread. So that legacy is sitting there, and they came to me five years ago, and they said, we have to redo this. And that was the Marx family who bought it from the Helms family. And I said, well, you have to wait a little bit. And while they were waiting, I was thinking about all the different things we were going to do. I looked at the plans, and they wanted 5,000 of the 10,000 square feet just to be baking. Well, my restaurant brain said, absolutely not. How am I going to go out the back door and start to populate? It's exactly what you were saying. How can I touch the people? I'm used to the restaurant where I make it, I bake it, they get it, they eat it, they poop it. It's done, right? <laughs> so what do I do? So I said, let's change the plans. This is why it's taken the extra year. Because now I, I want it where it's little vignettes. And we'll have our little coffee station. We have our little, our little deli station. So I'm going to make that sandwich. And you're not going to know that it is all that good stuff. It's just going to taste freaking good. And I don't have to explain it. I don't have to put two, 20 labels on it. And then next to that will be the wood-burning oven. And I'll have all my beautiful flatbreads. And in the back, we've got a mixing mezzanine. And we've got a thing down below. And then we've got the roasting station over there. So it's like a little mini circus. And, but we'll be able to do all these things. And I can be... Uh, cheerleader and granny to push, the, push all this good stuff on everybody and they won't even know. So that's the mission and that's my story. Bye. So one question, how do you make it good? Love. Oh. It's true though. If you don't, sin sincerely, I know it sounds kind of hokey, but if you don't have the love, like you're, you, what you do, you're just so passionate about it. What you're doing over there is so passionate. You know, you're bringing what you love in it, and it shows in the food, and it doesn't matter whether you're making a piece of steak or bread. It's just, is what it is. Okay. So, Chad, can you talk faster than that? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Hello, everyone. I'm Chad from Tartine Bakery. Um, thank you for putting this thing together, Bob. Um, when this guy here, Dave Miller, was the second person that I, baker that I apprenticed with, I had started kind of, but all the bakers that I worked for, like four different bakers, were all primarily whole grain bakers. So that was kind of the way that I learned. And I realized I was taking a lot for granted that sort of, uh, you know, Dave was committing to the, the entire uh, biodynamic crop of uh, Fred Kirschman every year and he was milling everything fresh daily and it was kind of the first time I had seen you know a baker that was just completely focused on whole grain and once I sort of left to start my own bakery which was uh, in Point Ray Station I had um, I'd kind of gotten away from the whole grain for a long time um, focused more on the wood-fired oven and the the different sort of uh, aspects of fermentation to develop the flavor. And over so many years, sort of uh, building up the whole, my, my baking style in California, I, the, the amounts of uh, like different varieties of tomatoes and produce and all this just seemed to increase to where we now have, you know, 100 different varieties of tomato. And when I started, it was more like 10 or something like that. So the idea that, um, this kind of variety of flavor could be, um, in, that we could find this variety of flavor in grains 
was something that I started to think about. And during the time I was, I was traveling to Europe for different reasons, family-related reasons, and I was very interested in the food movement in Copenhagen and Stockholm, Sweden, and I was interested in researching um, those sort of heartier breads in the countries where they, they had that tradition. Um, and so when I, when I went there, I found that they were growing dozens, maybe probably hundreds of different kinds of um, older varieties of wheat that they were bringing back, Nordic varieties, and just totally blew my mind, but I, I didn't think to really like research what was happening in the States until I got home, and then I saw that, you know, this whole time when I wasn't really focused on the whole grain and what they were doing, that people actually here were, were growing all these things and all these, these small grain economies were happening. And then I went to visit Steve and Jonathan at the bread lab and, you know, and then I, my mind was totally blown. You know, he has 40,000 kinds of barley there. And, and then I, I realized that, you know, yeah, we're just sort of scratching the surface of what's, what's I think is gonna happen with all these different grains that we're gonna have and be able to utilize. Um, what I learned from Dave and, and Richard Bourdon before that and then the other bakers that I worked for in Europe was, you know, respecting the grain and, and the, with Dave especially, fresh milling, which I'm not doing right now, but, um, and focusing on hydration and a long natural fermentation to really make the loaf of bread that, that you're creating um, nutritious and, and digestible um, for people. So that was kind of... Uh, what I took with me from all the bakers that I that I learned from, um, the thing that I kind of wanted to to try to introduce in Tartine Book Three with our last book was to try to um, think of new ways of getting more different kind of grains into a loaf of bread, specifically um, grains that don't don't that aren't really suitable for making a loaf of bread without gluten, like. Um, buckwheat, I mean some of these are pseudo grains, but barley, buckwheat, even different ways of getting rye into a loaf of bread. And so that whole, that whole idea was just to um, hopefully give bakers more tools and, and as bread eaters just more, more variety of uh, flavors that we can all achieve to kind of uh, just increase the whole spectrum. And we're, we finished that book and then Last time when I went to visit uh, the bread lab with these guys, they were doing they were doing malting grains uh, for uh, beer production. But then I'm sort of taking some of those malting and uh, beer like beer uh, grain techniques and applying them to bread. So we're just still trying to continue to develop new techniques and new approaches to getting more varieties of whole grain into the bread. Um, we. We have a new space also that we're, we're um, starting to build soon. It's going to be a while, but it's sort of hard. Tartine is such a kind of machine right now. It's kind of hard to swap everything out. We've put, we've put whole grain cookies on the menu, and everyone loves them. Um, cookies are kind of the easiest thing to start with 100% whole grain because just the, the mechanics of a cookie works really well um, as far as pastries go. But we're hoping to sort of add the whole line of what, we're, what we presented in our last book which definitely will introduce um, more of the whole grains when we get our new space open. So that's the plan. Um, that's it. Why don't we jump to Jonathan this way, then we'll come back and go back down the Okay. Okay. There you go. Hello. As, as said, I'm Jonathan um, from the WSU Bread Lab, um, working under uh, Stephen Jones and, um, and with the grad students and um, thank you Bob again for putting this on and um, <clears throat> I just feel very honored to be up here um, especially with a lot of my teachers and um, those who've given me tremendous inspiration to, to keep moving forward as a baker and to keep innovating and to keep aspiring to learn every day and, uh, and to improve and um, so that's a real, real treat and honor. Um, Mac McConnell was actually a, a very influential teacher for me at the San Francisco Baking Institute. And, uh, and also Eduardo Morel um, when he was baking uh, in the Headlands. So um, 
now I'm at the Bread Lab, and what is the Bread Lab? Uh, <laughs> we're still trying to figure that out. Um, this is kind of a big bread lab, actually. It's kind of an expanded galaxy of a bread lab. Um, you know, there's scientists here, there's enthusiasts here, there's bakers here, there's chefs here, there's farmers here, um, maybe there's brewers here. Um, there's a wide variety of people coming from a wide variety of backgrounds that are going to use grain in one way or another. And um, the Bread Lab is this kind of meeting place uh, for open experimentation um, with grain. And we try to not really leave anyone out um, other than you know, some of the big scary commodity companies. Um, so other than that, it's, it, it, it's a place that we really encourage uh, the community to kind of coalesce around a system that works for everybody. So I know it's been mentioned that the grain um, doesn't need to just work for the baker to make a really nice loaf of bread. It's got to work for the, the person who's farming it. You know, um, They have to be able to get a substantial yield and to have you know, a, a crop that's going to stand up um, to stay in business. Um, so we try to look at it from this really holistic um, point of view. Um, the lab itself is split into, you could say, two halves, two hemispheres. Um, one is this kind of super analytical, science-y side, and that's where Bethany and Colin hang out uh, most of the time, and some occasionally for, forbid me from entering. Um, and, uh, there we test a lot of the rheological properties of grain using machines that are um, common to a uh, quality testing lab. And um, although we use these machines not necessarily for what they are intended for, um, <laughs> we're trying to find a new, uh, a new model to, um, or, or maybe no model, but we're trying to get off of this old model, this uh, kind of Wonder Bread model for the way we're evaluating grains and um, we're, uh, you know, uh, for, is, you know, we're trying to do something for the craft baker and the, um, it's, it's just, uh, that, that's a process and that's why we, <laughs> we need more people to come in and teach us. Um, we do do some teaching, so to speak, but um, a lot of what we do is have guests that come and work on projects. So we've had, we've had the pleasure of having Chad Robertson come up and um, uh, give a tour and he's gonna hopefully come up at the end of the month and we're gonna do some baking and um, it's just a it's it, you know it's a great place to take the pressure off of um, production to really sit and think uh, what what can I possibly do uh, it gives that kind of space um, dr. Jones has been very strict with me um, in that um, he's I have to use exclusively whole grain. Um, and if I break it apart, I have to put it all back together. <laughs> so I can't really get away with just, you know, sifted stuff or, um, I can get white flour, but then I got this huge pile of bran that I gotta somehow and get back in there. Um, so um, a great thing that's come out of that is um, we found new flavors. Um, oh, that's the other thing. He, uh, he also has been forbidding what he calls, anyone can throw you know, a handful of into a dough to change the flavor of it. Um, he said, what can you do with just the grain? So um, that's been a really tough one, especially when someone, we have a guest baker that comes up and you know, throwing all these like roasted seeds in and you know, fruits and I'm making this delicious bread and I'm just like, I wish I could do that <laughs> again. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Um, but it's been a challenge, and uh, you know we're just trying to um, try to discover new things. It's not about making the best baguette or the best loaf of bread. I mean, it's great when that happens, but uh, a lot of it's really bad bread. A lot of it's a lot of mis it's a lot of mistakes. It's I mean, this is research. You know, you have to try everything, and if something doesn't work, you you, you gain from that nonetheless. So, so I just want to just to give the basic, because I, I don't know if it's clear that in the bread lab you have all these devices. You have Farina graph, Avila graph, falling number, and you're making, and those are devices that are really 
as I understand it, set for industry. And so you're taking that analysis and finding variations in, in wheat and saying, okay, well, this is what we can do with it. So that you're, you're, you're sort of turning it on its head. It's, it's sort of using it, not what, was it intent, not what it was intended for. Well, in a sense, okay, what, to use it for what it was intended for, it's uh, a, a device that's intended to give objective scientific information. Um, it's something that will print a readout with the graph and have numbers and figures that, uh, that's data. Um, and as long as you have kind of a standard um, to go by, that you can show the differences and say wheat varieties based on you know, real analytical, objective, scientific data. Um, the other side of the lab is the subjective side. That's the baking side. That's the side I'm mostly on. Um, that's when um, we will take something that maybe didn't perform well, that has super low protein, or you know the crop got rained on, and uh, we found it had a lot of enzymatic activity that's you know really messing it up for bread. Or what can we do with it if it's not good for bread? What else, what is it good for? Say we have this one wheat that's um, you know you run the Farino graph, which essentially um, uses torque. It's a uh, torque by time, so it uses torque to measure. Um, to bring the gluten to development and then to bring it to the point where it actually breaks it to show its strength. And it gives you a graph showing how much torque and time was required to do that. Um, we've had some wheats on there that just just totally tank. I mean, I mean, terrible Farino graph, but then it makes the most incredible pasta you've ever had. I mean, it's just, so part of what we do is try to find, we try to make it work. and. Um, that's what I'm reminded of when I see everybody here, is we all ha are coming from different places. And we all need to make it work somehow. So we're trying to keep our minds open and um, trying to um, apply the model of the unified mind. So the bread lab has a analytical side and an artistic side. It's kind of like the brain, you know? It, it, it's really two different ways of approaching the same thing. So, um, I, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> all right. Why don't That's we? All. all right. So we'll come back to you. So Dave Miller again, the father of a lot of these people, I think. <laughs> I, I don't think so. <laughs> now you're all too old for that. <laughs> well, I didn't know that sweater. Yeah, I've been listening for so long. I don't think I. I've got to switch to the talking mode. Um, I, I've got so many thoughts on this. I don't know what to talk about and what not to talk about. Well, like where you started and, and what you learned. Um, <laughs> this is 20 years, right? Uh, well, I started baking um, in Minneapolis for uh, a pretty good quality bakery called Sherman Bakery that's not there anymore, and a, a production bakery. And uh, there would be, there was about 20 bakers in this bakery, and um, it was a valuable experience. It taught me to work quickly and efficiently and kind of the basics of uh, baking. And I was about to take a trip to uh, the East Coast with a friend, and the day before we left, I saw this notice on, a <clears throat> on the uh, billboard of a bookstore about this new sourdough bakery that had opened up in St. Paul. So I thought we better check this out. So I went there, and um, and there was this this little bakery with a bunch of dense little round loaves on there. And I bought a bought a loaf and took it home, and was really uh, affected by it. You know, my whole body was affected by this loaf of bread. So I had to go back and talk to the baker, and I did. And it was this young guy who um, had only been baking for a matter of weeks. And he kept talking about his teacher, you know, my teacher this, my teacher that, asking me if I knew what organic was, and I didn't know what organic was, mm -hmm. macrobiotics, um, telling me that you can make bread without baker's yeast, and, you know, I've been a baker for two years, didn't know that. <clears throat> this is in mid-80s. And his, his teacher was Richard Bourdon, so um, I wound up apprenticing for Richard. I called Richard after that, and... Um, and that was kind of my transformative experience. Um, Richard, 
used freshly milled whole grain flour in a lot of his breads. And that was the first time I got to smell fresh flour. And uh, the first time I really had an experience of working with whole grains. And um, I was hooked from then on and, and just sought out um, more bakeries that, that used the same process, sourdough leavening, whole grains. Some of them were fresh milled. And started my own bakery in California. And, um, and it grew and it, it uh, kind of exploded at the point uh, that Chad came on. And um, I wasn't having any fun at all. Um, I didn't have a, a larger bakery in mind when I started baking. And uh, right away I was trying to plan on how to get rid of all the volume and, and, and whittle it down to something that uh, I could appreciate taking from the very first step to the last step. And so we did that. Now it's just a, a very small bakery um, in what used to be my garage. Um, over the last 25 years I've worked with two primary farmers um, for my grain, for my for the majority of my grain, um, one in North Dakota for 11 years, uh, actually 13, and um, and one in Northern California for 10. And uh, for me, I just love to have the image when I when I empty the the bag of wheat into the hopper of the mill to have that image of the farm, where the wheat came from. Um, that's important, and it makes me feel like the bakery's grounded somehow. Um, um, so that kind of brings me to, to present day. Um, Did you much the last yeah, time? it's changed a lot. Yeah, it changed? Um, you know, I don't know if any of my customers could tell you if it's changed. Um, and I don't know if I could tell you how because it's so hard to think, well, what did my bread taste like 10 years ago or, <laughs> or even look like? Um, um, I'm always fiddling with things, and when you get different lots of wheat every year from different farmers, you have to, and that's part of the fun of it. Um, uh, I really enjoy that part of it. I really enjoy, you know, numbers that come from the alveograph or the phrenograph or the protein content don't really tell you too much, and you just have to start mixing dough and and working with it and seeing how it responds and trying this and that and this and that and two or three months later usually is the period of time it takes me to get something I'm happy with. Um, yeah. Hey, I just want to say I'm very proud of Jonathan, everyone. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just it's nice to see that, you know, that he, he, he was working for me when, um, when he got the, got the, you know, the call from, from Stephen and, and went and interviewed. And I'm just really happy to see that you're, you're doing well. And I want to thank you, Bob, for having us all together. I remember, what was it, probably four years ago now? There were about maybe 30 of us sitting in this room when this whole project started. So it's really great to see the response in the community. So um, thank you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, my name is Eduardo Morel. I've uh, had my bakery, Morel's Bread, for, uh, I guess the, uh, I've been baking for 14 years, but the bakery has been in, in operations for about 12 now. I started in the, in the Marin Headlands. Um, I was the chef at Headland Center for the Arts. And uh, there was an Alan Scott wood fire brick oven in that kitchen, which I just was very interested in. There was a French baker there by the name of Laurent Pouget, I think. Chad also knew Laurent back in the day. And uh, I just got interested in what he was doing. And just uh, shortly thereafter, he went back to France to, you know, to be a baker back in the south of France where he's from. And I just started baking in that oven and uh, sort of teaching myself, like kind of being, as we all are, you know, scientists to a certain extent. And I like what Dave had to say that sometimes it takes three months to, you know, really get what you want because you really can only, you mix a dough, you can only make one change every time you make another dough because you have to know how that one change affects the dough and then you go from that making different changes. But um, I then just started selling my bread at the, uh, actually the farmer's market in Berkeley, even though I was, I was um, 
baking in Marin and living in Marin and eventually had a family, moved to move my family to Berkeley and now just in the past three months moved my bakery to Berkeley and it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful change for me. There's some of my bread up there, up on the, up on the counter. But uh, I came from this, like one, one of the things I, I always tell people is I have never, nor do I really know how to bake with commercial yeast. Um, I, people ask me questions and I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't know. I, I have been a sourdough bread baker from the beginning. And uh, when that's the, the kind of bread that I saw Laurent do, that's the kind of bread that I saw Alan Scott do. Um, and uh, learning from those, those two and then my own research just solidified for me within what I was doing that that was the way to make bread, especially with whole grains. There was just something very... I guess elemental about it, something that I knew my body felt good making this bread, my body felt good eating this bread, um, and everyone around me enjoyed it as well. Uh, and to me, it, even all those years ago, it made sense that this was the way to consume grains, was some kind of s souring or, or soaking or sprouting, that that was the way to do it. It felt right to me, um, even before I knew a lot of the science behind it. Uh, and that's kind of what it what what attracted me to it. I've purposely over the year kept, over the years, kept my bakery small and sustainable. I've always insisted I would only do what is sustainable for me and for my family. Um, eventually, I made a decision when I was baking in Marin. It was either going to sort of expand my bakery or disband my bakery. And uh, I'm happy that I chose to do a very small expansion by acquiring premises in Berkeley and, and baking there in West Berkeley, just six blocks away from my house. So uh, that was the only way I was going to do it, and it took me a long time to find the right space and to, and to you know, then to get the money to get the equipment I needed <laughs> to build out this space. But uh, it's, been, it's been a wonderful journey, and I've, I've known, you know, all these people here, uh, you know, for, for many years now and having many good discussions, and this is such a great area for it. Um, and I really feel strongly about the idea of baking with whole grains, baking with organic whole grains. I firmly believe it's the only way to go. Um, and uh, baking, you know, really good, naturally leavened bread. Um, and that it can be something that is Again, some, something that is very nutritious, very flavorful, and something that people would seek out before they would seek out anything else, uh, just like I did before I even, like I said, before I even knew all the science about it. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of where it's at. Thanks so much. Yeah? Okay. Oh. <laughs> Why don't you introduce yourself? Okay. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> Keep me on track I, do, here. I do a really good job, if you've noticed. <laughs> uh, my name is Josie Baker, and um, I've got a bakery in San Francisco called The Mill. And um, uh, I'm relatively new to this world. Uh, my, my love affair with bread started about four years ago. And um, I started baking at home and was, was immediately head over heels for it. And uh, started doing it all the time. <coughs> And had too much bread to eat <laughs> or to, to give away. And so one, one day, I gave, I gave away a lot of it. I also stored a lot of it in my freezer until my roommate told me I couldn't do that. Um, so I had more bread to give away. And, and one day, a, a buddy who I'd been supplying with bread um, offered to pay me for it, which hadn't occurred to me. But I accepted his money. And um, you know, a month later, I was selling bread subscriptions and um, delivering it around around the city on my bicycle. And a few months after that, I quit my job and started baking full-time, renting space from other bakeries around the city, actually in Pizzaiolo here in Oakland. And a few months after that, uh, the owner of Four Barrel Coffee invited me to uh, do a project with them. And it was the mill. And uh, the mill th itself actually wasn't, a, wasn't part of the puzzle until about six months in. Um, and that has its, has its roots in, uh, <laughs> I was on an island uh, in Thailand, and I was, was already uh, engaged in the process of, of uh, the cafe bakery with Four Barrel, and 
I realized I needed, I needed to have a mill in the bakery, even though I'd never milled before, nor had I even had fresh milled bread, but something about it really spoke to me. And so I asked a few of my bread nerd buddies, and they said, you got you to gotta go visit this guy, Dave Miller. So I, I emailed Dave Miller from the island in Thailand. <laughs> said, hey, man, I'm in Thailand, but I can't stop thinking about bread <laughs> and, and mills, and I hear you're the guy to talk to. And he said, oh, Josie Baker, Dave Miller, you come, come on out. Yeah. <laughs> so I went out, and um, he, he was gracious enough to invite me into his bakery, and um, we hit it off and was, was really struck with the quality of his bread and the integrity of his practices. And um, a similar, a similar dumb, dumbfounded feeling came over me when I saw his bread as when I first, when I first ate Chad's bread. So side note, I'm beside myself to be up here with these guys. Thank you guys. Um, but... Uh, yeah, so driving home from Dave's bakery, I said, okay, put the bread in the trunk so you won't eat it all on the way home. And I just pulled over, <laughs> over, <laughs> over and over again because it was so good. Um, and so that to me is, is really a critical piece of, of what we try to do in the bakery is we're, we're really, we're trying to make you know, nutritious bread, we're trying to make it responsibly, we're trying to be good people and we're trying to make bread that people really want to eat. Yeah? And so that's more than just the way it tastes in your mouth. That's also the way the loaf of bread looks on the shelf. And um, we, don't, we don't really advertise that we're, you know, a whole grain bakery. I mean, it's called the mill. And so if you think about it a little bit, you might reach that conclusion. But lots of people don't. Lots of people are really surprised, even when they're in this space, that we have a, a mill. Um, and then we show it to them, because it's in the bakery. Um, uh, recently, we've been experiencing uh, a lot more publicity than I could have ever imagined about our toast. <laughs> um, some of it good and some of it bad. But in the end, it's all good. It promotes the conversation that needs to happen. Uh, but one thing that that is... that. We don't, we don't really bring up is that our, our toast is all at least half whole grain. So all the bread we make is at least half whole grain flour that we mill in the bakery. And uh, uh, a lot of it is 100% whole grain. And we make it that way, first and foremost, because we think it tastes the best. Because, you know, no matter how nutritive the bread is or how responsibly it's made, if you don't want to eat it, people aren't going to buy it. You know, they might be curious about it and buy a loaf, but they're not going to come back. So um, we're really, really so fortunate to, to have the focus on making the highest quality food uh, that we know how to, and so many people doing such amazing work here in the Bay Area. So I'm really flattered to, to be considered part of that. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be sitting next to Josie. <laughs> um, I, my name is Rhonda Wiedenbeck. I'm from Beck's Bakery up in uh, Humboldt County, Arcata specifically. And I'm, I think I might even be a little newer than you are at baking. Um, my bakery's been in business for a year and a half. And, um, and I'm, I was baking bread at home too. And then I took a couple of classes at the San Francisco Baking Institute and learned to ton of stuff there that really um, most that really helped me think I could pull this off somehow and um, so anyway I, I wanted I come from a community that's got really great bread we have a couple of wonderful uh, artisan style bread bakeries and um, and I, but I wanted something a little more um, grainy CD and so I started making grainy CD bread at home and my friends wanted to eat it and and um, and so things kind of progressed along the way from that. And my friend Glee gave me this bag of wheat that um, her friend John Laboito had grown. And I was like, well, what the heck? Let's throw that in my little hand crank mill that's sitting on my countertop and I'll, I'll make some, some bread with this. And 
my first bite, I mean, this is a bread I'd been making for a while, and my first bite of this bread just stopped me, you know, in my tracks, and I was like, holy crap, what is this <laughs> kind of thing. And there was this phone number, you know, John had his phone number on, his, on the bag of grain, and so I immediately, um, um, no, I guess I, I wrote him a letter immediately, just wrote him a note, old-fashioned kind of thing, and um, he probably right when it got right when he opened it and read it he called me and we had this long phone conversation and kind of hatched this plan of doing a local grains using his grains in my bakery and I had no idea how this was all going to come together but um, but you know I didn't even know how this bakery thing was going to come together but we we uh, it, it ended up happening and so long story short I acquired a, a mill I have a 20 inch diameter um, stone mill in the bakery and I I remember talking to Josie about what is a mill room supposed to look like, and I and I called Dave too, and or emailed Dave about what how, what do we do with these things, because there's like no regulatory information on what you're supposed to do to make this work right. But um, we we pulled it off, we got it going, and um, and I'm working with um, three farmers. I work with John Laboito and Doug Mosel and um, the Heinleys. And um, so all of my wheat is is coming within most of my wheat is coming within 50 miles of the bakery, and um, and and they it's delivered in um, 55 gallon barrels, and I just put it into the mill and and try and make bread with it, and mostly I'm successful. Sometimes it's it's not so successful, but. But what, you know, first and foremost, though, is the flavor is incredible. And whenever anybody comes to the bakery, I make sure, you know, I'm like, come over here, you got to smell this and open up the tub of fresh milled wheat and, and have them smell it. And everybody's just enamored by it. It's so amazing to be able to do that. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the short story.